So let's look at some scenarios and see if a placebo is needed and what it might be. So a study of a new medication. So yes, we need a placebo here, most likely. Uh, and the reason is, again, because people tend, uh, when they take some kind of medication, they tend to feel better even if the medication doesn't do anything. And so we really want a comparison to see whether the medication does better than you know, sort of a fake medicine in the body's natural reaction. And so the placebo here would probably be some kind of fake pill, uh, presuming it is a pill-based medication. Uh, you know, commonly sugar pills are given uh, that look like a medication but are just filled with nothing. So suppose we have an experiment testing the effectiveness of a new fire retardant on fabric. Do we need a placebo here? No. Uh, here, really, we're just sort of testing, does the fire retardant work? Uh, and so we torch the, uh, the fabric and we see if it burns. Now, we could certainly have a control group here, and the control group would be fabric without the fire retardant. Uh, but there's not really a placebo here, because there's no fake treatment going on. So lastly, suppose a study on the effectiveness of a frozen meal diet plan. Uh, do we need a placebo here? Uh, and this one would probably do well from a placebo. Now again, it partially depends on what we're comparing to, but if this idea is, you know, does this particular frozen meal diet plan work, uh, then, then we really want to compare it to something that's in every other way equivalent. And so a placebo might be, um, I mean, one option would be to do, uh, do frozen meals, uh, that are, that are not diet, right? So the idea is that they're still eating in a similar manner, uh, of having regimented, uh, meals. Uh, they're still frozen meals that they have to heat up, uh, but they're not these specific diet meals. Now, this might be a little bit extreme. Some people would say, oh, we don't need to go that far, uh, but at least as a good placebo, we would want to, uh, suggest to our control group that they do everything else. So if, if this diet plan also included recommendations of, uh, exercise and, 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 you know, maybe eating out guides, then maybe we'd provide that same information, those same suggestions for exercising to our control group so that we get a really good comparison between the two groups. So now let's look at one, oh, yeah, let's look at one other issue here. Uh, and that's the issue of a blind versus a double and a double blind study. Now some studies, it doesn't really matter who knows what group they're in because, uh, you know, sort of you, like with plants, potting them in soil, the plant doesn't care what pot it's in. But in some cases, it does matter, uh, you know, what group they're in. So, for example, we did a case earlier where we, uh, had somebody, you know, one group drinking beer and another group drinking non-alcoholic beer. We certainly wouldn't want those, um, you know, people who are doing the drinking and the testing to know which group they're in. And so we would want this, we would want this to be what's called a blind study. A blind study is one in which the, ex the, the participants don't know what group they're in, uh, whether they're in the control group or the experimental group. And you almost always want that in a controlled experiment with, uh, people as the, as the subjects. Now, in a study about antidepressant medicine, you also would not want the psychological evaluators to know whether the patient is in the treatment group or the control group because it might influence their evaluation. So here, neither the participant or the experimenter knows, uh, which group each patient is in. The only person who knows is the statistician in the back. And so this is called a double blind study. Double blind because, again, neither the participant or the experimenter knows which group the participant's in.